with that in mind, uh, Olivia, if you'll go first and teach us about post-crisis monetary policy, um, the floor is yours. And again, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Yes, excellent. So thanks a lot again for the opportunity to present uh, this uh, this paper. So this is a paper about post-08 monetary policy, and this is joint work with uh, Bezat Diba from Georgetown University. So uh, basically, since the end of uh, 2008, the Fed has uh, de-emphasized its intermediate target for the Fed funds rate, and instead it has been communicating its monetary policy in terms of two instruments. One is the interest rate on bank reserves, the IOR rate, interest on reserves rate, and the other is the size of its balance sheet. Now, to assess uh, the main consequences of this policy change, we introduce banks and bank reserves uh, in a very simple way into the basic uh, new Keynesian model. And we show that the resulting model can account in qualitative terms for three key features of inflation in the US during the 2008-2015 ZLV zero lower bound episode. Okay, so these are the three uh, features of inflation that Cochrane has uh, emphasized as uh, posing some key challenges to uh, the standard uh, monetary uh, theories. So the first feature is that we did not observe any significant deflation, unlike what uh, old Canadian economics uh, would imply. Second feature is that we did not observe, well, we observed little inflation volatility, unlike what new Keynesian economics would imply. And the third feature is that uh, is no significant, significant inflation following quantitative easing policies, unlike what monetarist economics uh, would imply. So uh, our model, which is going to mix some elements of new Keynesian and some monetarist elements, is going to, well, account, uh, be able to account qualitatively for these uh, three features. And then we'll explore the implications of the model for monetary policy away from the ZLB, the zero lower bound, for the normalization of monetary policy and for its operational framework, essentially a comparison between the floor system and the corridor system. Now, one of the, uh, one of the key assumptions, well, the key assumption we're going to make uh, is that demand for bank reserves got close to cessation, but did not reach full cessation. So basically we're going to exploit a discontinuity in our model between being close to cessation and being exactly at full uh, cessation. Now, in the literature, you can find at least two arguments uh, that uh, go against or seem to go against uh, our uh, non-full cessation assumption. One is that QE2 and QE3 had no apparent effects on inflation or on inflation expectations. And actually, uh, this is a, an argument that has been put forward by uh, Ricardo. And the other argument is that the T-bill rate was below the IOR rate uh, by a few basis points during the ZLB episode. Well, the two counter arguments we're going to present in the paper uh, for the first argument is that the fact that QE2, QE3 uh, had no apparent inflationary effect is actually consistent with demand for bank reserves being close to cessation, not, you know, not just necessarily at full cessation. And uh, second, uh, the second counter argument uh, that we have is that uh, the reason why the T-bill rate was below the IR rate may simply be due to the fact that T-bills provide also liquidity services to non-bank uh, financial institutions. So here we're going to extend, to provide an extension uh, of our benchmark model with liquid government bonds that will uh, make this point. Um, now, I have a slide about the relative literature, uh, but maybe for the, in the interest of time, I'm going to, uh, to be very short on that. So we, there are many connected papers. We cite even more in the, in the paper. Let me just focus on the first point on, on this slide, which is that our model, the model I'm going to present, uh, can be viewed as a more structural cuisine of the standard MIU model, the Monet and Utility model. And the additional structure, well, it's not deep micro foundations, but it does bring some additional structure to the uh, MIU model. And this additional structure serves to first deliver sharper 
analytical uh, results. Uh, second, discipline the calibration of our uh, quantitative easing experiment. And third, guide our extension with liquid government bonds. Now, that being said, let me uh, turn quickly to the model, just in two slides, actually. Uh, starting with households. Households, I mean, the representative household consists of workers and uh, bankers. And the, its, utility, its intertemporal utility function is the following here, where psi t plus k is just a preference shock. Um, and then u, v, and v, b are uh, functions. u is the consumption utility function. v, the lab, the, v is workers' labor utility function. v, b is bankers' labor utility function. And we assume that bankers use their own labor uh, plus bank reserves to produce loans. According to this function here, technology uh, function FB. So admittedly, this is a shortcut to capture the fact that in reality, uh, bank reserves are useful to manage the uh, liquidity of the loan portfolio of, uh, of banks. So because this is a shortcut, we're going to impose as few restrictions as possible on this FB function. So we're going simply to assume, you know, to make standard assumptions like concavity, we're not going to consider any specific functional form for this function. And the same for the utility function above, U, V, and V, B, uh, standard assumptions, no specific functional form. Now we can invert this F, B function and we write bankers labor disutility as a function gamma of loans and real reserves, real loans, real reserves. So it's a positive function of loans and a negative function of reserves. This is utility cost of uh, banking, right? And the, the first order conditions of households uh, optimization program is going to, uh, or are going to imply that ILT, the interest rate on loans is going to be higher than IT, the interest rate on bonds. Why? Because it is costly to produce loans. And IT in turn, the interest rate on uh, bonds is going to be higher than INT, the IOR rate. Why? Because bonds serve only as a store of value while uh, reserves provide liquidity services. Um, turning to firms, well, firms are quite standard, monopolistic, monopolistically competitive, owned by households. Uh, using workers' labor to produce outputs, according to this function F, again, no specific functional form. What we assume, though, is that firms have to borrow a fraction, well, possibly 100% of, uh, a fraction of their nominal wage bill uh, in advance from banks at the gross nominal interest rate, ILT, the uh, interest rate on loans. And this assumption is here to generate a demand for bank loans. On, on the previous slide, we had an assumption that, generated, that generates a demand for bank reserves. Here, it's the assumption that generates the demand for bank loans. Now, prices can be sticky a la Calvo. And finally, the central bank has two independent instruments in this model. One is, well, here, the gross nominal interest rate on reserves, IMT, which cannot be lower than one. This is the ZLB. Uh, in the model, this is because banks also can use vault cash uh, as a substitute to uh, reserves. And the second instrument of the central bank is the quantity of nominal reserves, CAPMT, or equivalently the growth rate, nu t, of uh, nominal reserves. Okay, so now let me, I mean, after this two slide presentation of the model, let me turn to the first. Uh, claim we make that the model can account for um, uh, the first inflation feature, uh, which is no significant deflation. So to do that, we are going to uh, analyze the global perfect foresight equilibria of our model under flexible prices. Why flexible price? Because, uh, well, under sticky prices, that would be just untractable. So we do assume flexible prices. We ignore preference shocks. And we uh, consider a constant IOR uh, rate equal to IM and a constant growth rate of reserves equal to mu. Under these assumptions, we get a dynamic equation 
of the following type that link uh, current workers labor HT to uh, the next period uh, workers labor H uh, T plus one. And what we show is that provided that the uh, value, the constant value of the IR rate IM is between one, which is the ZLB, of course, and the value mu over beta. Again, mu is the growth rate, the constant growth rate of uh, reserves, nominal reserves, and beta is the discount factor. So mu over beta is going to be actually the steady state interest rate on bonds. So it's very natural that the IOR rate uh, should be uh, lower than this uh, value, mu over beta. So provided that IM is between one and mu over beta, we get a unique constant inflation equilibrium with inflation equals to mu, the growth rate of reserves. And we also can get what we call deflationary equilibria. Uh, we call them this way, but actually these are equilibria in which the inflation rate is below mu. The inflation rate is not necessarily, the gro gross inflation rate is not necessarily below one, but it is below mu. We can get, we do get them, these equilibria, if and only if IM is above mu. So what does it imply? Well, for a permanent ZLB episode, or put differently, a ZLB episode that is expected to be permanent. So IM is uh, forever equal to, mu, to one, sorry. Then the model is going to rule out deflash, our deflationary equilibria as long as mu is not lower than one. So here it's a very standard result, the same, basically the same results as the one we get in the literature in Opsel Rogoff or Benavid and, and company. What's more novel in our uh, analysis is the possibility of uh, a temporary ZLB episode. Temporary in the sense that it has to be followed by something else and the something else is a permanent new normal uh, with IMT and UT, the two monetary policy instruments, set to some constant values IM and U. In that case, uh, we can also get uh, deflationary equilibria if and only if IM is above mu. Again, the same condition as the one I had on the previous slide. So, simply uh, viewed from uh, from uh, this um, uh, from uh, from here. It seems like, well, because we can have global deflationary equilibria, uh, what happens to our claim to that we can explain the absence of any significant deflation? Well, because of the following uh, additional results, as the value of the IOR rate, IM, approaches the value mu over beta, which is again, the steady state interest rate on bonds. So, as IM goes to this value means as the steady state spread between the IR rate and the interest rate on bonds goes to zero. And this is a situation of interest. Why? Because it corresponds to a new normal with ample reserves of the kind discussed in policy circles. Then as this happens, we get that inflation in these so-called deflationary equilibria uniformly converges to mu. So in practice, that makes the inflation, uh, equilibrium inflation, uh, undistinguishable from, you know, uh, from you as you just approach more and more uh, these values. So to summarize, our model here provides two alternative explanations for the absence of any significant deflation at the ZLB. Either inflation cannot be below mu, or it can, but not by much, okay? Now, if I turn to the second inflation feature, which is uh, little inflation volatility, what we do to show that our model can account for it is to log linearize the model under uh, sticky prices, assuming that IMT and UT, the two monetary policy instruments, are set exogenously in the neighborhood of some values. So we do log linearize uh, the model around the unique steady state, and we get three equations. The first equation is the standard IS equation. Second equation is a Phillips curve, which looks like the standard new Keynesian Phillips curve, except uh, mostly for the presence of a real reserves term here. Where does it come from? It comes from the fact that as you increase the stock of real reserves, this decreases the costs for banks to extend loans 
to make loans to firms. So it decreases the borrowing costs for firms. So it decreases the marginal cost of production uh, of firms. Okay. And the last equation here is simply a, a reserves demand uh, equation, a standard one. So if you use these uh, three log linearized equations, you get a dynamic equation in the price level. So P hat T here is the log deviation of the price level from steady state. This dynamic equation is, has a characteristic polynomial P of X, which is of degree three. So actually it involves PT, the current price level, PT plus one, PT plus two, and PT minus one. And ZT here is the exogenous driving term. Now, what we show is that the roots of the characteristic polynomial P of X are always, always in the sense, whatever the structural parameter values, always three real numbers, rho, omega one, omega two, such that rho is between zero and one, and omega one, omega two above one. As a consequence, because we have two uh, non-predetermined variables, uh, two unstable eigenvalues, we uh, satisfy Blanchard and Kant's uh, conditions, and we get always local equilibrium determinacy. What does it imply? Well, under a permanent ZLB episode, it means that the model rules out sunspot-driven fluctuations. Uh, that can explain the low inflation volatility. Uh, and it does that unlike new Keynesian models. And there are temporary ZLB episodes. So what happens is that in standard new Keynesian models to overcome this difficulty of indeterminacy, you typically assume that the ZLB episode is temporary and after a finite bet, you go back to steady state. But in this case, so you don't have any multiple equilibria anymore, but in this case, the current variable, so current inflation, depends on expected future variable, uh, shocks, sorry, expected future shocks, in a way that increases exponentially with the horizon of the shocks, okay? In our case, instead, the model makes inflation depend on, depend on expected future shocks in a way that decreases exponentially, not increases, but decreases exponentially with the horizon of the shocks, unlike in Kimmel. Here is the expression for inflation, as a function of future exogenous driving terms, Z, T plus K. And the coefficient here is decreasing exponentially to zero as K goes to uh, infinity. So that also can explain why inflation is at least little volatile relatively to uh, inflation in uh, new Keynesian models uh, in our model. And we show that these results that you know stem from the the ability of our model to generate determinacy uh, under an exogenous policy uh, rate. Uh, these results are essentially robust uh, to first the endogenization of nominal reserves. So suppose that the central bank uh, follows a rule for uh, nominal reserves, a quantitative easing rule. And it's all, they are also robust, robust to the introduction of household cash alongside bank reserves in the monetary uh, base. So that's for the second um, inflation feature. Let me turn to the third inflation feature we want to explain, which is no significant inflation following quantitative easing policies. So to address this issue, we conduct uh, a nonlinear numerical simulation of QE2 uh, in our model with sticky prices. Actually, QE2, but also two times QE2, three times and four times QE2. I'm, I'm going to explain that uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, to do so, what we do is to consider this time isoelastic uh, functional forms for the production and utility functions that we have. And we calibrate the model to match some features of the US economy in November, 2010. Why November, 2010? Because this is the start of QE2, okay? Uh, and what we get is that, uh, is that we get very small inflationary effects of these uh, QE experiments under two key conditions. Okay? A lot of structural parameter values don't matter uh, for the results, but two are key. First, we need demand for reserves to be close to satiation meaning IM being close to mu over beta or the steady state spread between the IOR rate and the interest rate on bonds being close to zero. In our benchmark calibration, this is going to be 10 basis points. And second, we need the monetary expansion to be perceived as temporary. 
if the monetary expansion was, were perceived as permanent, the results would be much more inflation. So let me show the results graphically here uh, with this figure. So uh, the left panel of the figure uh, shows the, how nominal reserves, cap MT, evolve over time. So we start from a steady state value of 1 trillion of US dollars, which was basically the value of nominal reserves in November uh, 2010 at the start of Q2. And we increase uh, the stock of nominal reserves from 1 to 1.6 trillion of US dollars over three quarters, just like during the QE2 experiment. Then we stay at 1.6 trillion of US dollars for many quarters. And finally, we go back to the initial value, um, uh, which we reach after five years, okay, 20 quarters. So in the, the line with the little stars here corresponds to just one time QE2. The solid line to two times QE2, because we move from one to 2.2 trillions, uh, the dashed line three times QE2 and the dotted line four times QE2, that's a move from one trillion of US dollars to 3.4 trillions, okay? So what happens to the spread is shown and inflation are shown, uh, is shown in the middle and right panels of the figure. So the spread, which I, as I said, was 10 basis points initially at the steady state, falls. Okay, in all cases. Why does it fall? Because you increase uh, the amount of reserves. So for households to stay indifferent between holding bonds or holding reserves, well, the spread between bonds and reserves has to, uh, the bonds and reserves rates has to fall. It falls from 10 to about six basis points under our one-time QE2 experiment then to 4.5 for the two times QE2. And then it falls less and less as we move from one to four times QE2, because remember this is a nonlinear simulation and the spread cannot be negative. So it is bounded below by, uh, by zero, okay? So the effects on the spread are less and less important as you increase from one to four times QE2. And the effects, so are the effects on inflation. Uh, under QE2, the impact on inflation of this, you know, big increase uh, or expected increase in, in reserves is only 20 basis points, right? And as you move from one to four times QE2, it increases less and less uh, up to 35 basis points for four times QE2. So that's why we claim that, um, well, we, the model is consistent with uh, uh, very small inflationary effects of uh, at least QE2 and, uh, and presumably QE3 as well. The two, remember the two key assumptions are uh, a, a small steady set spread. So if instead of considering a 10 basis point spread, we had a 20 basis point spread, basically the inflationary effects will be uh, multiplied by two. So instead of 20 basis points, we will have 40 basis points per annum. And again, and the second assumption is the length of the, the perceived length of the monetary expansion. Here it's five years. If we increase that to 10 years, again, the inflationary effects will be roughly uh, doubled. So instead of 20 basis points, we will have 40 basis points, which remains quite uh, modest, uh, modest we, we think. Um, then, as I said, uh, we have uh, an extension uh, of our benchmark model with liquid government bonds. And that extension serves to uh, offer a counter argument to the fact that, uh, that, um, that to the argument that Presumably, the demand for bank reserves was satiated because what we observed was that the T-bill rate was below the IOR rate during the ZLB episode. So what we do to reconcile our model with this negative spread observation is that we introduce government bonds that provide liquidity services to banks and to non-banks. Banks have access to the IOR rate. Uh, other financial institutions, non-banks, don't have. And we show that our model with liquid bonds 
has an equilibrium in which the IOR rate is above the TBIL rate, in which banks hold only reserves for liquidity management. And this equilibrium coincides with the equilibrium of our model without liquid bonds. So our extended model explains this negative spread between the TBIL and IOR rates at the ZLB, but still preserves the implications of our benchmark model uh, for inflation at the ZLB. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so um, turning to uh, the implications of our model for um, monetary policy away from the ZLB uh, this time. So first, for the normalization of monetary policy, meaning uh, what's going to happen when uh, the central bank is going to raise its policy rates and uh, reduce the size of its balance sheet. Well, uh, we analyze this, uh, we address this issue by uh, log-linearizing the model around the unique steady state as we've already done before. And we show that in our model, current and expected future IOR rate hikes and current and expected future balance sheet contractions are always deflationary, okay? So, if you announce that you're going to raise rates in the future, this decreases inflation today. If you announce that you're going to reduce your balance sheet in the future, this is deflationary today. So in particular, our model does not imply any neo Fischerian effects, okay, in which you would increase uh, inflation by increasing rates. And finally, as I said, we also study the implications for the operational framework of monetary policy. We consider two frameworks, a corridor system and a floor system, which are the two main frameworks that are currently being discussed. And what we show is that they have substantially different implications for determinacy in our model. So basically under a corridor system, our model is just isomorphic to the basic NK model, meaning that if the IOR rate reacts only to current inflation in this, in this rule, then it needs to react more than one to one in order to ensure determinacy. This is the Taylor principle, but under a floor system, if again the IR rate reacts only to current inflation, then any non-negative reaction will uh, lead to uh, determinacy. So there is no such thing as the Taylor principle uh, under a floor system. Uh, then my conclusion is just a summary of all the results. So I can as well stop here. Super. Um, we didn't get any questions in the chat, so let me remind anyone, if you have a question, just please just type question into the chat, and then I'll ask the presenter. Let me ask you a little question, Olivier. Um, I mean, your results or certainly the simulations depend, of course, on the function you assume for the production function of the banks and how it involves the reserves. Given this paper, if you were to speak then to an empiricist that comes after your paper, what would you say are the way for me to be able to calibrate that, to be able to measure that? What would be the things that you look for in the data for us to get a better handle on that function? Because in a sense, you're introducing it here in this paper and we really need to measure that well if we're gonna use this theory and be able to put some numbers into it. Um, sure, I entirely agree with you. This is, uh, this is going to be key. So for the, again, just for the theoretical results, we don't make any assumption on that except standard assumptions. Now we do have some empirical illustration of uh, the effects of QE. So we need to calibrate the model uh, in this, uh, in this uh, sense. The, for that, we uh, look at uh, isoelastic, um, isoelastic um, specification for this FB function. And we calibrate the parameters of this isoelastic uh, function, functional form, uh, using some features of the banking system in the US in November, uh, in November um, uh, 10, uh, at the start of uh, QE2. So basically what we look at is the uh, is what is the quantity of nominal reserves, of course. We have to take a stand on the spread between, uh, between the IOR rate and the, uh, the interest rate on bonds. So because, and this is going to matter for the, 
the implied value of the coefficients in this isoelastic functional form for the FB function. And because during this ZLB episode, the, the TBIL rate was below the IOR rate, we cannot just uh, use this negative spread to calibrate our FB function simply because our model does not, is not consistent, our benchmark model is not consistent with the negative spread. So instead we, is, we use um, some results, uh, I mean, we make an assumption about 10 basis points that comes from basically uh, a paper by Nagel uh, here, but this is you know, more like a guess than anything else. And then we conduct some sensitivity analysis. And as I said, if you double the spread, so you're going to change the, value, the coefficients of this isoelastic function, and you're going to double as well the inflationary impact of QE2. Very good. Let's move on to the second speaker, which is going to be Guillaume Plantin. Um, so Guillaume, again, you have 30 minutes, and anyone in the audience, if you have a question, just type question into the chat. You should be able to do so. And then I'll stop Guillaume halfway through if something arises. If not, I'll let you go, Guillaume, and warn you a couple of minutes before. Stop. Okay. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Okay. We're seeing it. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that's joint work with Jean Barthélemy, who's with Banque de France, and Eric Mangus, who's with HEC. All right. So, so the 2008 crisis and the COVID crisis have been very different along many dimensions. Um, but what they had in common in terms of public finances are massive negative shock to fiscal surpluses, of course, and, and big surge in, in demand for safe stores of value. And uh, public finance responses to these shocks have, have had similar features, massive issuances of public liabilities, both sovereign debt and central bank reserves. And, and central banks have used these large amounts of reserves to invest primarily in, in government bonds and in, in a number of private liabilities as well, those of the most distressed corners of the, the economy. So the, the comments on, on, on these unprecedented evolutions have, have gone a little bit all over the place. Uh, Ten years ago, you could read a lot that Basically, Sargent and Wallace's unpleasant matter arithmetic was, was, was at play. And so basically, it would be very difficult to escape future inflation. Uh, These this fiscal actions of central banks meant basically some loss of central bank independence. Uh, not much inflation appeared since, so the views have a little changed. Given that rates are, are perceived to, to be persistently very low, uh, many observers say as well, but these public liabilities issued by governments and central banks are basically bubbles and they will repay themselves. There's nothing to worry about in terms of central bank independence. Some observers even contend that uh, we're not fully exploiting those low rates and we could and should do even more. Uh, the central bank could give instead of lending, for example, with, with, with uh, devices such as helicopter money. And what we're doing in this paper is offering a simple, qualitative, but rich framework to think about these questions of central bank independence in this new environment. So we basically solve Wallace's game of chicken, you know, Neil Wallace has coined that term, game of chicken, to describe the strategic interaction between central bank and a fiscal authority that ex post disagree on the policy objectives, the fiscal authority being biased towards spending and the central bank being biased towards price stability. Um, and there hasn't been that many formal models of, of games of chicken and what they imply in terms of price level path, for example. Uh, so that what is, that's what we do, right? We solve for reasonably tractable model of the game of chicken. Uh, and we do so in a low rate environment, such as the one we're in now, in which both M, the central bank, and F, the fiscal authority, can issue bubbles, can issue and back liabilities. So there are two reasons why we're interested in the game of chicken. First, as I said, it's because it hasn't been that much covered in the, in the macro literature, at least. And the second reason is that we think that if you want to think about central bank independence, 
you have to study it in a model in which it matters. So if you study a model in which the public sector, all components of the public sector agree exposed on what the optimal policy is, then, then central bank independence is irrelevant. And the reason we've set up independent central banks in the first place is, is, is uh, the key and Prescott reason. We know that uh, exposed, they're likely to disagree. Uh, and that's the kind of situation we study. So what I'm going to do is give you a simplified, uh, shortened description of the model so that you see what's in it. And, and, and then explain where we get the main, our main results from there. But let, let me give you first the, the punchline of the paper. If there's one thing to, one message to remember from this paper is that uh, what we find is that when you have these two conflicting authorities, the one that preempts private demand for public storages can impose this, its views and force the other to chicken out. Okay, the way you can think of the game of chicken in a, in a world of low rates is a rush towards private demand for liquidity by F and M. F and M both try to preempt that liquidity, F by issuing a lot of debt, M by issuing a lot of reserve. F uses the proceeds from issuing debt to finance the current deficit to spend. M uses the proceeds from issuing reserves to buy back the public debt issued by F from the private sector. And so because F issues and M buys back, the relative firepower of each authority, its ability to attract private liquidity, determines the net increase in the quantity of government debt in the hands of the private sector. And what our model says is that it's this net increase of government debt in the hands of the private sector that predicts future inflation. Okay, so if M can issue as many reserves as it wants to buy back debt, then it can keep inflation under check uh, in, this, in this new world. Whereas if F is faster at printing liquidity and M cannot catch up, uh, there will, then F will force M to chicken out and inflate away that debt in the, in the long term. So model, I'll give you the main ingredients. It's an OLG model that's always very, that's not necessary, but that's sufficient to obtain bubbles very simply. So we have a, an OLG model of heterogeneous agents, savers and entrepreneurs who live two dates each. The population size is fixed. Uh, everybody consumes when old. Savers have an exogenous real endowment that they can store at a low return. The return is smaller than the population rate, smaller than one. Uh, that's a source of dynamic inefficiency, of course. Uh, and these savers, most of the time, can trade with entrepreneurs who have no money, but have a technology with a superior return, a return strictly larger than one. So in normal times, what we call normal times, credit markets function seamlessly between savers and entrepreneurs. So savers lend to entrepreneurs and they share these high returns. But there are crises, there are episodic crises during which the credit market shuts down. So during such crisis, the only storage available to savers is a low return. So if we, if we, if I, if I call phi t, it's going to be a notation I'll use throughout, phi t, the um, real return available to savers in the private sector. Uh, well, whether this real return is smaller than one or not on average depends on the frequency of uh, financial crisis. Okay. So we study both cases in the paper, but the, case, the only case I'll talk about today is the case in which the crises are frequent, so that sufficiently often savers have access only to uh, very low returns in the private sector, and that creates room for rational bubbles that the public sector can issue. Of course, the private sector can issue bubbles too, uh, and we don't rule that out, but we're not interested in those bubbles. We're only interested in those raised by F in the form of government bonds, unbacked government bonds, and M, the monetary authority, in terms of unbacked reserves. Public sector, so there's a fiscal authority and a monetary authority. Fiscal authority is very standard. It does two things. It issues nominal bonds and it operates transfers. So nominal bonds, one period uh, bonds, BT is the number of bonds issued at day T due at day T plus one. And the transfer for simplicity, I restrict the analysis to only two types of transfers, even though we consider everything in the paper, 
um, first transfers between F and the private sector, consider sigma T transfer from young entrepreneurs to F. And then theta T is the transfer from the monetary authority to F. You can think of it as a dividend when it's um, positive and as a recapitalization when it's negative. Okay, so tra real transfers, those transfers are real, issuance of nominal bonds, one period. Sorry, what are we doing? Um, monetary authority M. So M issues reserves and announces and commits to a nominal interest rates RT on them. Okay, so reserves are fairly realistic in the sense that they're nominal, they're claims of infinite maturity. Uh, it's a cashless economy, so with your reserves, you get only reserves later, okay? And you can buy goods, of course. So reserves are claims of infinite maturity, and a unit of reserves at day T is a claim to RT unit of reserves at day T plus one. Reserves are the unit of account of the economy, and so the price level in this economy is the, is the price of the consumption good in terms of reserves. How, how many reserves, units of reserves do you need to pay at day T? in order to consume one unit. Objectives of F and M. So what's important is to, to model the game of chicken. And that's how we do that simply. Uh, so first you have this binary var variable delta T. This variable is equal to one if at day T, the fiscal authority defaults on the government bond by default I mean, outright default, you promise 100 and you repay less than 100, okay? And this variable is equal to zero otherwise. So you see that both F and M dislike default. They have a disutility from default. That's important and that's exogenous, okay? We, don't, we have nothing to say on why the central bank doesn't like sovereign default. That can be financial stability reasons, for example. Uh, we take it as given. Apart from this component, the reason F and M disagree is that F cares mostly about subsidizing the entrepreneurs. Remember that the most productive agents in this economy and in crisis in particular, they have no money, even though they, high, they, have, they earn high returns. So the government wants to subsidize those guys, but F doesn't care about the price level. On the other hand, the monetary authority cares only about the price level. There's an exogenous target PM at each date that the monetary authority tries to get as close to as possible. All right, so we've met the, the problem as simple as possible with this very stark difference in preferences. F cares only about spend, cares only about spending, M cares only about price stability. What we really need for the paper to work is that they expose disagree. Um, I will talk only about the case in which F actually has an infinite aversion to default. F is willing to do whatever it takes to avoid default. Uh, a priori, that stacks the deck in favor of central bank independence, because if F is willing to do uh, efforts such as fiscal consolidation to avoid default, that's going to be good for uh, the central bank. And we'll see that even in this case, uh, there are loss, losses of independence in some cases. Important ingredients of the model, uh, it's an ingredient that's always there in, 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 for those of you who are familiar with the fiscal theory of the price level. At the beginning of the model, there's a legacy exogenous liability of the fiscal authority, okay? When the model starts out at date zero, the savers who are born at this date are endowed, if you want, with a nominal claim on the fiscal authority of L nominal units due at date one. So the standard interpretation of that is that there's been long-term debt issued in the non-model past in an exogenous way. Uh, an interpretation we prefer in, in our context of the public sector facing a, bad, a, a big crisis is that this liability is more an implicit liability. There's the need to bail out the economy Otherwise you face a much more dire situation. Um, and so it's really an implicit liability. In this case, the cost of defaulting on them is not that you default on an explicit promise, but is that the economy completely collapses. 
But however, you interpret it formally, it's the same thing. It's a nominal claim q by f at date one. Timing. At each date t, the monetary authority first announces a rate on reserves, or t, between t and t plus one. Then the market for reserves opens up and clears. I will show you uh, how it clears in the next slide. Then the primary market for government bonds opens up and clears. Then, and that will be very important, there's given, given, given the preview of the results I gave you, there's a secondary market for government bonds that opens up and clears in which both F and M can buy back issued bonds from the private sector, okay? And basically at the end of this stage four, the game is, is over at this stage, M and F agree on what to do. So they decide on transfers to each other and on transfers to the private sector. One authority makes a take it or leave it offer to the, to the other. Whichever authority makes the offer is not so, not so important. And in the end, F repays maturing bonds if it can and if he wants to do so. Okay, so that's the timing of the game. Some market clearing, I really won't go into the equation and, and give you a gist of the, of, the, of the result today, but so that I, I can be credibly taken seriously, I'll show you some of them. Uh, reserves market clearing on the left hand side at the T of the supply of reserves, that's the past reserves due. So you had an inventory of reserves X T minus one at the T minus one, uh, remunerated at a rate or T minus one. And the monetary authority is free to issue reserves, delta T. That has to be positive, of course. Uh, and market clearing implies that it has to be equal to the price level times the private demand for reserves, XT. Okay? Uh, of course, the monetary authority can also, I haven't put it in here because it won't play a role in the equilibrium, but if you wanted to uh, reduce inflation, you could also buy back reserves. So there could be a private demand for reserves by the monetary authority, buying back some reserves and canceling them. But you see that in a perfect foresight equilibrium, which are the equilibria we consider, because you control RT minus one and delta T, you can pretty much for a given path of XT, and if the fiscal authority is nice to you, uh, for a given path of XT, you can control the price level by playing around with the quantity of reserve you issued, and the rate at which you remunerate them. Of course, things are trickier if there's a zero lower bound, something we consider also in the paper, but that we don't consider here in this baseline model. Then primary bond market clearing, that's straightforward. What is issued must be equal to the private demand for bonds and the price, because bonds and reserves, that's important in this model are perfect substitutes, uh, the return, the expected return on, on bonds has to be the same as on reserves, okay? So this small BT and this small XT, they're very important because they really characterize what the particular equilibrium is, okay? Remember, we're in a world of bubbles, a model of bubbles, and the only resources of the public sector are these bubbles that they issue. And at each day T, um, the private sector is willing to buy some bubbles from the central bank, for a real value X, and some bubbles from the government for a real value B, okay? What's going to characterize a given equilibrium are these two guys, X, small X, the real private demand uh, for reserves, and small B, the real private demands for B. That's really what describes the behavior of the private sector in this model. And then secondary bond, bond market, the bonds that have been issued endogenously and possibly the exogenous liability at date zero can be repurchased by F and by M. Okay, so the central bank issues reserves, trying to control the price level. The fiscal authority issues bonds. The central bank and the fiscal authority are allowed to retrade bonds. And once market have cleared, M and F agree on transfers and whether to default or not. So what is an equilibrium? The, the definition of equilibrium, because you have a mix of strategic interactions and a standard competitive equilibrium in an environment with bubbles, we have to be a little careful in how we define the equilibrium. And 
we are in the paper, here I will focus on, on the intuition of what an equilibrium is. So an equilibrium is a policy first, a policy comprised of transfers, sigma, the, the transfer minus the transfer from the government to entrepreneurs, theta, the transfer from M to F, issuances at each date, uh, there are government bonds BT issued, and there's an inventory of reserve XT. Bond purchases by both F and M, and an interest rate, okay? So what does it mean that we have an equilibrium? What does it mean that we have a game of chicken? Well, first, this policy must be feasible. That is, there must exist a bubbly equilibrium in the private sector taking this policy as given, okay? Such that markets clear, private agents optimize, and the budget constraint of the fiscal and the monetary authority are satisfied. So that's the first condition. The policy has to be feasible. There are many feasible policies because there are many patterns for bubbles possible. Among all these policies, well, among all these policies, a policy is an equilibrium, is a game of chicken, if roughly none of the authorities has an interest in deviating. What does it mean deviating? It means that an authority could come up with a deviation, a new policy from the T on, uh, that would be feasible and that would generate a strictly higher utility for that uh, authority. Okay, standard um, equilibrium concept for a sequential game. At no point can an authority deviate and say, no, after all, I don't want to do this. I'll do that because that gives me, because the continuation path, if I do that, gives me a higher utility, okay? So here is what's a little subtle in our equilibrium concept. We impose that for, for, for policy to be an equilibrium, we impose that there's no deviation that uh, would strictly increase the utility of the deviating authority uh, without requiring higher bubbles in the future, okay? because we have many Korea with many different bubbles, what we say is, well, the fiscal and monetary authority can compete for the current liquidity that's out there, but uh, what the equilibrium will be in the future, how much the market will be willing to, uh, how, how many bubbles the market will be willing to purchase in the future from F and M, that F and M cannot influence it, okay? So the fiscal and monetary authorities, when they deviate, have to take as given the size of the future bubbles that they will face from the T plus one on. It's only if, given these future bubbles, given these future demands, maximum demand for bonds and for reserve, you can make yourself strictly better off that you will deviate and that the situation is not an equilibrium. Okay? So there are many equilibria, many games of chicken, many, many feasible games of chicken, and each of them are really indexed by um, the behavior of the private sector. Okay, you can index the set of equilibria by the, the sequences BT of XT of real demand for government bonds by the, by the fiscal authority and by, sorry, by the private sector and, and real demand of reserve XT. Of course, these real demands have to be a feasible bubble on aggregate because the only resources of the public sector are these bubbles. People are willing to purchase future uh, demand for bubbles. So the bubble must be such that it can be bought back by the future generation later on, okay? All right, so there are two interesting results um, from these games of chicken, this non-cooperative equilibria. First, the first kind of result, so you remember there are, there are, there's a very special date in that model, that's the date one at which the government owes an exogenous liability L that we interpret as an unanticipated shock like the 2008 crisis or the COVID-19. But the other dates, the dates different from one are, are such that all liabilities are endogenous, okay? So the first result, is if you want for those other dates. First question is that without this exogenous liability, are we even in a monetary regime? Can the central bank 
even uh, implement its price target. Well, we have a first interesting result is that without fiscal requirements, and I'll tell you what fiscal requirements are in a minute, there's actually no monetary determination of the price level during a pure fiscal regime. What is a fiscal requirement? A fiscal requirement is the assumption that the public sector at day T cannot pledge 100% of its future resources. Okay, because there are no taxes here. The future resources are the present value of the future, the future bubble, the future demand for public security. What we're saying is that if the public sector is allowed to raise resources against 100% of that, then we're in a fiscal regime, actually. The fiscal authority can impose its use to the monetary one. And in fact, the only equilibrium is that the price level is equal to PMT, the target of the central bank, plus alpha M. You remember that the central bank has a, an aversion to default. It costs alpha M to the central bank uh, to, let, to let the government default. So of course, the fiscal authority cannot go beyond alpha M because the fiscal authority was telling the central bank, well, I don't default only if the price level is PM plus alpha M plus two, then the central bank will say, well, go ahead, default, that's better for me, okay? So in particular, I mean, maybe that's obvious, but the fact that the central bank cares for nominal default is crucial to have that result. If the central bank didn't care at all for nominal default, then we will be in always in monetary dominance. But as soon as the central bank cares for nominal default, and, uh, absent, in the absence of fiscal requirements, basically F can flood the bond market with paper with an implicit future price level that's very high, that's PM plus alpha M. That's good for uh, the fiscal authority because it can inflate the reserves that have been issued under the belief of a smaller price level in the future and generate more resources, okay? And so F will always do that. And so the only price level that M can set is PM plus alpha M. But in these normal times without the exogenous liability, with an arbitrary small fiscal requirement, if you don't let the public sector uh, issue that against 100% of this, but 99.9%, .9%, then you're completely back to a monetary regime. Then at all other dates than one, the monetary authority can impose its price target, okay? Why? Because an arbitrary small intervention in the secondary market, even though it's arbitrary small, it's crucial, can undo the belief of any price level above target. Okay, so first result, without any fiscal requirements, even though the central bank moves first, even though the fiscal authority cares a lot about default, you need a small fiscal requirement if you want the central bank to have any chance at implementing the price level at all. Two all right. One minute. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. That's my last uh, slide. Um, now, what if there are small fiscal re requirements, but you have this exogenous liability at date one L? Well, suppose that you're in a favorable situation where in which the resources to the public sector at date one are sufficient to repay L given the price level target of the monetary authority. Okay. So F and N both agreed that it's important to maintain the price level at P1M, they could do it without defaulting. Now we see that the strategic interactions are important because if the fraction of this future liquidity that the monetary authority can collect at date zero by issuing reserve X zero is too small, then we'll have that the price level at date one will be higher than the monetary target, okay? And the idea is that the authority that preempts most liquidity imposes its views. If X zero is small, it means that F has been able to preempt that ample liquidity that the public sector had at date one, has been able to preempt it at date zero in order to subsidize the date zero entrepreneurs. And then the monetary authority has no choice anticipating that than promise a higher price level at date one, okay? So the authority that preempts most liquidity imposes its views. That's the main lesson from the model. Um, just one word to conclude. The, what motivated this paper first is the, the remark that we're definitely not the first to have made. Basseto and Kui have, have a very nice model on, on paper on that recently, that when you have low rates, 
the entire temporal budget of the government is no longer a necessary condition for equilibrium because there can be bubbles. So the, the fiscal theory of the, of the price level does not pin down the price level. For a given path of surpluses, you have many feasible price levels. So what, what our first intuition was that, well, it's great news for the central banks if, if rates are low, their hands are not tied by fiscal policy. They can choose several price levels uh, that work given a fiscal policy. And we thought, but wait a minute, before, before, in order to study independence, you have to study it in a model in which independence matters. And here the news is not good. We find that when independence matters, this uh, degree of margin that the public sector has when rates are low is actually captured by the authority that can preempt liquidity. Uh, we have nothing to say on who preempts liquidity under which conditions. That's, very, uh, that's basically a cross-sectional comparison of equilibria, but that's the first message from the paper that fiscal requirements are not obsolete when, when the, even when the monetary arithmetic is pleasant. Thank you. Quick question about the, uh, the objective functions of the, the authorities, monetary and fiscal. So I understand you take them as, as given, you kind of justify uh, the, the, the cost of defaults, of outright default for the central bank uh, with the financial stability issues. But at the same time, it's a zero one uh, variable. And I would expect uh, that if you have a tiny bit of default, it's not as, uh, as important as a 100% you know, default. So do you, would, you have, uh, would you expect to have similar results if you relaxed uh, this, uh, this assumption here about the, the, the objective function of the central bank? And more generally, because you take anyway these objectives as given, what will be the normative implications for, for policy delegation in your model? I mean, if you could choose objective functions for F and M, what will they be in order to maximize some kind of welfare? I understand this is not a representative agent model, so this is more difficult, but we'll, I mean, yeah. Uh, well, two very good questions. So first one, if we had the concave preferences over, over inflation, spending and default, you would have in equilibrium some default, always. That would be anticipated, of course, so that would be reflected in the, in the, in the, in the rates. You would have incentives to default. The central bank would say, okay, you can default a little bit, that saves me some inflation. Uh, and that would be reflected in the, in the spreads exactly, uh, up to the point at which there's no default in equilibrium. And the exogenous objectives, actually, there would not be too hard to endogenize if, the, if F had a commitment problem. If F would like the, um, the price level to be stable, but would like entrepreneurs to have lots of resources to invest, it would be tempted to, to, to inflate their claims away ex post, in particular if private claims were nominal. Okay, so setting up an authority that can commit to do ex post inefficient things will be useful. So in a sense, in a sense, the preferences are not too bad as they are right now because the central bank has the right preferences. Uh, the problem is it doesn't always have the means to implement these preferences. Uh, so the message from the paper would be more that um, these, these objectives have to be complemented with fiscal requirements. And when the arithmetic is unpleasant, when there are no bubbles, that would have been to be complemented with uh, man mandatory recapitalization of central banks when there was money. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. But otherwise, Dongai, please go ahead. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, I guess you can see my slides. Thank you for including our paper into the, the program. And thank you all for, for coming to be uh, to attend this section. So this is a, a joint work with my four colleague, former colleagues uh, from Barcelona. Shen Liang now works at the uh, Shuf and the Jean Ping uh, gonna join the Shandong University as assistant professor. And myself, I'm a assistant professor from at the University of Bonn, a beautiful campus, as you can see uh, in the background. Cool. 
Okay, so in this paper, basically we do a, a salt experiment, a salt experiment that is motivated by the following observation. So over the past decade, we have witnessed an expansion in the usage of um, digital price tags. Why this is happening? Well, thanks to the growing affordability of uh, ESL, electronic shelf labels. Now this pattern might have or might well if it's uh, 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 keep going in the future, such technology, such a technology advance might facilitate price adjustment and therefore reduce the degree of nominal rigidity in the economy. And therefore the salt experiment that we ask, uh, uh, that we do and the question that we, that we ask is such a, is such a te technological progress worth improving. Moreover, um, while well, nominal rigidity might be changing uh, in the economy due to some other technologies, but if it's indeed reduced due to the, uh, the expansion of uh, digital price tags, then such uh, technology progress uh, might only apply to the retail sector. Therefore, a nom reduction in nominal rigidity might only be a sectoral phenomenon. Therefore, uh, related to the question that we ask if uh, what happens what are the changes in the result? What are the uh, 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 welfare implications if uh, such a reduction is a sectoral uh, phenomenon? And moreover, we, we address what is the role played by central bank. All right, so what exactly we do in this paper? So in order to address those questions, we built a multi-sector New Kingdom model with nominal rigidity that, gonna, uh, vary, that we're gonna let it vary and the dispersed beliefs. So two predictions, both predictions we can find the abundant nowadays, we can find abundant uh, empirical evidence, empirical support uh, 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 in the literature, nominal rigidity, you can uh, consult, the, for example, Nakamura Steinson's and uh, information frictions with dispersed beliefs, you, uh, uh, we can find the evidence provided by uh, 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 various papers by Kuebio and the Gordon Schenkons and, the, and the, uh, other groups of researchers in the literature. Um, so those are two, therefore those frictions are relevant in the data and uh, we're gonna show that those frictions are relevant for the understanding of uh, welfare consequence of phenomenal communities. Um, we're gonna look at, with this model, we're gonna look at how a change in aggregate or a sector of nominal rigidity affects social welfare. We're gonna first derive a closed form solutions with a static model um, and then we're going to show that uh, first, uh, first the, the results from the static model extend to the dynamic model and we're going to adjust what is the role pl played by persistence of shocks in a dynamic model. A preview of results. Um, so in the paper we're going to discuss a lot about the mechanisms. So we're going to focus in particular we're going to focus on two uh, channels. The first one is the well-known uh, and the common uh, everywhere channel that we label it as a cowboy channel. So that is the inefficient price dispersions that arises from uh, staggered price settings. So that is uh, uh, the price dispersions among two groups of firms, uh, the ones that uh, who can reset price and the, uh, the unlucky ones who cannot reset price. And those price dispersions are well uh, detrimental in, in our model or in the Kingdom model. And related uh, uh, um, welfare loss is uh, cross-sector price dispersions. So not only uh, price dispersions among different variety of meat, but also price dispersions among meat and drinks can uh, generate uh, welfare loss as well. What we want to highlight, what we want to bring uh, um, the mechanisms to the attention of, uh, of uh, academic literature and the policy uh, circle is that is the, the so-called dispersed belief channel that we label in the, in the paper. That is the inefficient price dispersions arises due to heterogeneous be beliefs. Those are the price dispersions among the group of firms who can reset price. Right? So in a standard model with perfect information, all those firms who can reset price, they reset to the same price, but in the presence of information frictions and, uh, uh, and the dispersed beliefs, those firms who can reset price, they're gonna set to a different price because of uh, heterogeneous beliefs. And this, again, uh, such a dispersion in price is gonna be welfare detrimental. The main takeaways uh, from our analysis is that while well, a 
taking all these considerations, a reduction in nominal rigidities might uh, deteriorate welfare. We label it as the paradox of price flexibility. And moreover, whether there is paradox or not depends on uh, many features. First, whether it depends on whether such a reduction in infliction is a sectoral phenomenon or, or an aggregate uh, uh, pattern. Second, it also depends on uh, information frictions. Third, it depends on the elasticities of substitutions, both within a sector and across sector, and the fourth, it depends on the persistence of the shocks. And the fifth, fifth we won't highlight uh, in, the, in the separate uh, row, is that monetary policy also plays a crucial role in resolving or mitigate the paradox. Okay, so we're gonna go more into details about this result and uh, Ho uh, hopefully I will uh, be able to convince you about the results. So our paper attaches three different literatures. First, of course, the information frictions literature there nowadays, a lot of papers, we put uh, uh, tons of paper here, but if I miss some of uh, your papers, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to tell me and I will include it in the paper. Now we, our contribution with, with respect to this literature is that we, uh, we built a multi, we essentially we extend a, a model with both nominal rigidity and uh, information friction to a multi-sector model in order to conduct our sort of experiment. And second, the literature, so luckily we, we are not the only one who is uh, uh, interested or who is uh, investigating in such a, uh, a sort of experiment. So this, this uh, exercise, uh, dates back at least uh, to long summers in, in 86. And the recently, uh, John Diga Lee has uh, uh, a couple of papers with the co authors that adjust uh, such uh, uh, whether the reduction in nominal rigidity is so well improving or not. And Agus and co authors also contributed to this debate. So the, both of those recent papers, uh, including in long in the summers, they focus on whether reduction in nominal rigidity affects the welfare and through the volatility of output gap. Uh, our focus is on, on price dispersions and the way emphasize uh, uh, information frictions. And the third, uh, we also attach the literature about uh, optimal inflation index stabilization policy because we have a multi-sector model, it's natural to, uh, to study uh, such a policy. So whether um, so what is the ultimate weight that the central bank should attach to different the uh, inflation of different sector uh, in the in, in inflation stabilization policy. Um, the seminal papers are by Aoki and Benigno, also by uh, Manquio and Ricardo. Um, uh, they have also contributed to, to this literature. Our, our contribution, our result, our novelty of our uh, um, model is that we show uh, with the information frictions with uh, the presence of a dispersed belief channels, it alleviates uh, the standard uh, relative nominal rigidity that has been emphasized by, by Mankey and the and, uh, and the Benigno uh, that are uncovered in the early 2000s. All right, so the roadmap ahead, we're gonna go through with the great detail uh, within the constraint of timing of 30 minutes uh, about the static model. And we're gonna briefly uh, discuss uh, implication in the dynamic, mod dynamic model, but uh, despite being briefly, hopefully it will be sufficient. Uh, okay, let's go to the static model. It's a multi-sector model and we're gonna, um, so the way it's easy to extend it to, to as many sectors as you wish, but in the paper, we focus on two sector models. House, uh, representative households with uh, uh, following period utility, households that get positive log utility from uh, aggregate consumption and the DC utility from labor. The aggregate consumption C is composite goods of uh, 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 goods uh, across two sectors. And this composite uh, function is a CS fun CES function with, uh, with uh, elasticity characterized by eta. And each of the sectoral uh, consumption goods, C of K itself, is a composite of uh, different varieties of goods within the sector. And this composite function, again, is a CES function uh, characterized by, uh, by epsilon. Um, and epsilon eta uh, determines the degree of competition within the sector and the degree of competition, uh, competition across sector. <clears throat> 
a household to maximize utility subject to the budget constraint. Now the relevant, uh, the most relevant uh, 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 optimality condition that we can derive from household is what is household uh, optimal expenditure allocation, given there are different variety of goods within a sector and there are different varieties across sector. So across sector, household, uh, households optimal, optimal expenditure allocation gives us this uh, sectoral demand function that firm face. The demand for sector case goods depends on the aggregate demand, aggregate C, as well as the relative price of the sector with respect to the aggregate price. Uh, similarly, the demand function for a single variety within the sector depends on the aggregate demand of that particular sector and the relative price of firm I's uh, price with respect to the aggregate price in this sector. So those are the common uh, standard results so far. We're gonna assume uh, a continuum of uh, monopolistic competitive firms uh, in each sector with uh, common production functions of, uh, of common production of common functional form. Each firm I in sector K um, has, has a linear production function um, with, um, AT, AK times the labor. AK is common across firms within the sector and firms, uh, firms objective is to maximize uh, profit whenever possible. So whenever the firm is allowed to adjust the price, the firm is gonna set the price uh, to maximize the, uh, the profit subject to the demand function that I just showed in the previous slide. All right, so uh, once we solve, once you solve uh, firm's optimization problem, the local linearized uh, uh, functional form of a firm's uh, solution is, uh, is shown in this equation four. For, for a optimizing firm, this firm I in sector K can be set the price uh, P star Ki as uh, depending on what is the aggregated price in the economy, what is the aggregate output gap. So X is output gap, uh, level of output minus the natural level of output with the natural level of output defined as the one that survives without the nominal friction and the without the information frictions. And also the optimum price depends on UK and UK essentially is the relative uh, product, product, productivity, productivity across sectors. It turns out that if we work with uh, a two second model of uh, equal size, then U1 gonna be equal to minus of UT, that is there is uh, one sufficient uh, state of the economy uh, U that, uh, uh, that is sufficient to solve the model. So for, to, 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 in order to get uh, closed form solutions or in order to get uh, readable closed form solutions, we're gonna work with uh, sectors of equal size uh, throughout of the paper and we're gonna work with U rather than um, sector level productivity in the static model. Firms are subject to two, to two frictions. The first one is nominal rigidity a la Calvo. So one minus theta K fraction of firms in, sec in sector K are free to adjust the price and the theta K of firms cannot uh, adjust the price. The bigger is a theta, is the bigger, the bigger is nominal rigidity. If theta is equal to zero, then we have a fully flexible price. Second, information frictions. So importantly, firms, they do not observe this uh, uh, aggregate state of the economy U, the relative uh, productivity across sectors, which is normally distributed with mean zero and uh, sigma uh, variance sigma U squared. Although firms do not observe this uh, uh, state of the economy, firms observe private signals. For each a firm, observe and only observe one signal, SK of I, which is, which tells you something about you, but with noise. The noise is distributed with variance sigma E squared. Um, the belief updating, updating rules for firms are rational, uh, conditional information frictions. They can use space rule to update the beliefs and in this static model, the base rule is gonna be extremely simple. Firm's expectation about the U condition on its information, which is essentially SKI, gonna be common gain times SKI. And the common gain, it depends on the relative position of the signal, so sigma E square, uh, with respect to the volatility of the shocks, sigma U square. All right. What does central bank do? The central bank conducts a, a strict price index stabilization policy. 
So first, the central bank choose a price index uh, um, characterized by weight omega. Omega is the weight that uh, the price index attached to the price of sector one and the remaining weight attached to sector two. Once central bank choose such an index, central bank commits to fully stabilize it. Throughout the paper, we're going to con uh, consider two types of uh, this uh, 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 multi-policy rules. First is uh, the CPI, so, or PCE, which is basically what the central bank across the world uh, uh, does. Uh, with CPI, essentially, the weight the central bank choose corresponds to the size of the sector, so omega equal to N1. And second, we also can consider what would happen if central bank were choosing uh, the price index ultimately by choosing omega such that the expected worker loss is minimized. Okay, so the model, despite the model being a static model and uh, the, the static model uh, start with a steady state, once we uh, go to the state of the model, go inside the, this uh, uh, um, period of the model, uh, it consists of four stages. In the first stage, the central bank has to choose, has to decide the inflation index uh, that she commits to st stabilize and to fully communicate uh, this policy route to the to the economy, to the agency in the economy. In the second stage, the shocks realize uh, both the fundamental shock U and the signals that the firms, each firm observed, realize. In the third stage, given the realization of shocks, firm draw the supply curve uh, in the good market, and then in the last stage, uh, the representative household who has uh, full information gonna make a consumption and the labor decisions and at the same time, uh, all market clears. The welfare loss function, so we're gonna look at how nominal rigidity affect the welfare loss. We're gonna need a evaluation criteria and uh, this gonna be a welfare loss function derived as a, a micro fund data, derived as a second order approximation of household utility. So it's basically composed of three components. The first two are the usual ones. So the welfare loss depends on the output gap of volatility, X square, and the relative price gaps across sectors, and, uh, and the price dispersions. Now let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, this price dispersion. The price dispersions itself composed of two components. The first is, uh, again, the usual ones uh, that, would, uh, the, that you would find in the textbook, the carbon component. So as I mentioned in the introduction, introduction that will be the price dispersions across the lucky firms and unlucky firms. And uh, uh, what we want to emphasize here is the dispersed brief component uh, of uh, the price dispersion uh, component. Those are the heterogeneous prices that arise um, arises due to dispersed beliefs among those firms who can reset prices, all right? And the relative, uh, um, so as you can see that uh, the, the parameters epsilon and the eta shows up here. So those cannot be the parameters that the characterize the relative force of price dispersion and the cross sector price gap uh, component in the welfare. Therefore, our result can uh, depend on epsilon and the eta. And epsilon uh, stands for the degree of competition within the sector and eta degree of competition across sectors. So uh, we're gonna show you a bunch of results, uh, but uh, before, before that, let me be 100% clear that uh, the welfare loss that we show you is the delta of the welfare loss, that is a change in the welfare loss uh, as compared to uh, uh, the status quo. So what, what we're gonna plot, what we're gonna show is what is, what is the, the level of uh, welfare, what is the welfare loss in deviation from the current welfare loss Condition on the same model and the same market policy model. There are two types of models: so one with information friction and the one with uh, out information friction. The uh, the welfare loss at the status quo is calibrated uh, with uh, uh, with a uh, degree of uh, um, nominal rigidity equal to 0.75 that is uh, consistent with empirical values. Okay, let's go to the results. Let's start it with extremely simple case with perfect information. So a model with perfect information, so it's textbook uh, to set the model. And let's look at what happens uh, if there is the economy-wide reduction in nominal rigidity. This is uh, summarized in proposition one. So in such a model, um, whether there is a paradox depends on the parameter eta and the epsilon. In particular, if eta is greater than half of epsilon, 
then the worker loss is strictly increasing in theta. Therefore, uh, reducing theta is always uh, worth improving. Otherwise, the worker loss is a, a, a concave function. That means that uh, uh, depends what is the value of the theta that you take. It might be worth improving or worth uh, uh, deteriorating. And the intuition is extremely, as I have high, uh, anticipated before, um, it depends on those uh, elasticity, elasticities because uh, those elasticity determines uh, the relative importance of uh, uh, cover price dispersion and the relative price gap. And this figure basically uh, plots the proposition one with the calibration. Um, so the calibration is chosen with, chosen with epsilon equal to six. So the um, epsilon equal to six suggests that the markup at within a sector is 20%. And the eta equal to one suggesting that uh, means that uh, the cross sector um, aggregator of goods is a cup uh, uh, function. And those are the standard calibration that you could find in the literature. With such calibrations, um, so the, um, the relative price gap component is plotted in blue, um, is strictly increasing in the nominal uh, rigidity. And uh, uh, the cover component is hamship. The cover component is hamship because, well, there, is, there will be no dispersion in price according to cover component. If all firms cannot adjust price, so that uh, that will be the right corner. Or alternatively, if no, if every firms can adjust price, naturally the work for loss would be uh, picked at the intermediate point. All right. Now with information friction, the Proposition is slightly changed, and uh, uh, in particular, the ham shape, gonna, the peak of the ham shape, uh, can depend on uh, information frictions. Let's uh, let's those are derived uh, with the closed form solution, but the, uh, perhaps for illustration, it's better to show with uh, with the plot. So here, I plot uh, the worker loss, the aggregate worker loss, as a function of price rigidity in the economy under three different calibration of uh, information frictions. The dash blue, uh, the dash green line, uh, the dotted green line is the case with perfect information. So it's handshake as we show in the previous uh, figure. And then the blue and the red are the ones with the various degree of information frictions. Both calibrations are perfectly uh, in the range of uh, what you, of what people find in the empirical studies. And you can see that with, with the moderated degree of information friction, that is the blue line, you can still see some uh, hand shape and when information friction is sufficiently strong, you will find the, a strict uh, uh, decreasing uh, line as a function of nominal rigidity, suggesting that uh, reducing nominal rigidity by no matter what the amount is always uh, worth uh, deteriorating. And this result, the previous result, is entirely uh, driven by the dispersed belief uh, component. So in this figure, we plot the decomposition of the worker loss of the aggregate of worker loss, which is plotted in red, and we show that each of these components, the relative price gap component, dispersed price belief, uh, dispersion, uh, price dispersion component, and the cover price dispersion component, as you can see that uh, the relative, uh, uh, the uh, price dispersion arises from dispersed belief is uh, driving the result. Next, we look at uh, what happens if such a reduction is uh, uh, a sectoral phenomenon. So that is only the retail sector uh, enjoys a reduction in nominal rigidity. We both look at the perfect information case and the information friction case in the, in the right panel. Within each model, uh, we look at uh, the red line. So that uh, would be the, what, uh, the, what is the uh, welfare consequence is if central bank conducts optimum policy and uh, the blue is what if central bank uh, uh, only look at the CPI stabilization policy. As you can see that in both models, if central bank conducts CPI stabilization, the paradox arises, but if central bank conducts optimum policy, then you be able to mitigate the greatly uh, the paradox in the case with perfect information, but you cannot uh, fully resolve uh, the paradox if there is information frictions. Let's look at uh, what is the intuition, right? So, this figure is the decomposition of the worker loss that I showed before for the perfect information case. Again, so different component, different components of the loss function, essentially. And we plot for the for model with uh, uh, 
CPI stabilization policy, the blue, and the ultimate inflation stabilization in the red. Let's start with the blue, where the paradox is shown. As you can see that the paradox in blue is mainly driven by the cover price component in, uh, in the sector two. This is due to the fact, due to the fact that uh, technology shock in sector one drives up aggregate uh, uh, GDP. As a result, the demand for sector two's goods is also uh, amplified. Now, if nominal liquidity in sector one gets, uh, gets smaller, so that's which is the sort of experiment that we run, we reduce nominal liquidity in sector one. And that means for the same size of technology shock in sector one, the demand, the demand effect that the sector two uh, gets is much bigger. As a result, sector two firms would uh, adjust the higher price whenever possible. Therefore, cover price dispersion would be extremely big if central bank uh, only stabilize CPI. Now, if central bank can, can re-optimize its policy by conducting optimal policy, as you can see that uh, with red line, uh, this cover price dispersion in sector two is greatly uh, dampened, but as a consequence, there's a cost, uh, cover price dispersion in sector one would arise. It would arise because the uh, optimizing central bank attaches higher weight to, to the price of sector two and the lower weight to price of sector one. As a result, cover uh, price dispersion in sector one arises. But it turns out that uh, this is sufficient to, okay, we have to one or two minutes a month. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, um, with information frictions, with information frictions, this uh, adds uh, additional trade-off to the, to the central bank optimization problem. Basically, now by assigning more weight to sector one's price, or well, it's true that uh, by assigning more weight to sector two's price, it's true that cover price dispersion is dampened. However, price in sector one gets more volatile because of the uh, information friction, uh, a more volatile price in sector one also uh, aggravates uh, dispersed belief price dispersion in sector one that makes uh, uh, the optimization uh, problem more difficult for the central bank. Uh, it adds trade off as a result of total welfare loss uh, in red is, uh, is still uh, declining in the degree of uh, nominal rigidities. Uh, due to the time concern, so let me skip uh, the optimum, optimum price index uh, part. Now the dynamic model, so the dynamic model will be basically uh, the same model, but with persistent shocks and the forward looking firms. Um, the persistence of shock makes a difference because uh, it's going to affect the cover component and the relative uh, uh, cross sector price dispersion component. Why? Because with more persistent shocks, the P star, those firms who can reset the price are gonna change, uh, move to a higher price because firms are forward looking. If shock is permanent, uh, they would uh, adjust higher price as compared to a shock that is temporary. It turns out that, uh, uh, therefore, uh, if you increase the degree of nominal rigidities, uh, um, and at the same time, if you increase, um, if you compare to a models with a different uh, uh, persistence, persistence of shocks, um, as the position of short increases from blue to red to, to green, uh, the cover price component uh, uh, takes um, a substantially much bigger um, role. As a result, uh, the welfare consequence will be um, of a reduction normal rigidity will be driven by cover component as, as the role becomes sufficiently big. Uh, so basically, with uh, row equal to 0.5, there's uh, still a paradox. With row equal to 0.7, there's still some uh, mitigated uh, paradox, but with, uh, with uh, sufficient persistent shock, uh, the paradox would uh, die away. Um, yeah. So let me, the um, yeah, so, so I, I guess I have uh, explained all I have done and the conclusion will be just uh, what I will show you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dongai. Okay, so let's move on to Stefan. Mm -hmm. uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, okay, let, let me just start and you tell me if you, if you don't see uh, anything that you need to see. Yeah. Uh, so this is a paper about monetary policy uncertainty. Uh, so in a way, I don't need to do much to motivate it. We've been living very uncertain time and all indicators of uncertainty are at an all-time high. At the same time, the past six months may not be uh, the, the best uh, example of the kind of consequences that I'm going to talk about. Uh, basically, in the past 
uh, six months, policymakers have reacted in the whatever it takes, whatever is necessary. How is it, Ms. Lagarde? So this is the kind of thing that policymakers have been doing in the past six months, which is to react in this no limits, whatever is necessary, whatever it takes uh, kind of way. So obviously uncertainty was not the only reason for reacting this way. Uh, there was some first order uh, moment kind of thing happening at the time, but uncertainty was only a reason to be more decisive, to act more promptly. And this contracts with the, the way that policymakers and central banks react in usual time. So if you just go back uh, one year ago, in March 2019, this is the kind of thing that Mario Draghi could say in a press conference. March 2019 uh, seems like an eternity, I guess. Uh, so just to remind you the context, there were some incoming bad news on the economic outlook in the euro area. The ECB changed a bit its forward guidance, but not much. And people were wondering, why don't you do more? And uh, Mario Draghi's answer was, in the dark room, you move with tiny steps. You don't run, but you do move. And this fits uh, very much more into the way central bankers seems to think about uncertainty, at least uh, when we are not in crisis times. So at all times, as a matter of fact, central banks must set monetary policy under substantial uncertainty on the economic outlook, but also on the effects of their policies. And usually the way they react to this is by being gradual or attenuating their policy. It's, here is another quote by Blinder in the, in the late 90s in which he says that a little stodginess at the central bank is entirely appropriate. And in particular, when central banks introduce uh, new and conventional instruments, uh, this was also an argument for moving gradually or not doing too abrupt changes to monetary policy because we did not know exactly the effect of those new policies. And this is actually an argument for which you can find a rational in the academic literature. Specifically, there is this famous, this famous paper, uh, paper by Brainard in the 60s, which came to be known as the attenuation principle. So I'm going to come back, uh, obviously, in a minute on what is exactly the rational behind Brainard principle. Uh, but for the moment, you can just sum it up this way. It says that yeah, if you are unsure of the effect of your policy, if you are unsure of the effect of a medicine, you should take a smaller dose of it. So this is what Breiner said 60 years ago. Uh, the point of this paper is to say, well, this is a valid argument, but actually when you apply it to monetary policy, there is a pitfall to it, which is the following. So first try to just apply the Breiner principle to monetary policy. For concreteness, you can take interest rate policy. So uh, you have, for instance, a disinflationary shock and the central bank can push up inflation to counteract the act, the, the shock by uh, decreasing interest rates. The Brainard principle would tell you, if you are uncertain about the effects of your rate cut, you should decrease it by a bit less. This is even though you know that you're not going to reach the inflation target, but that's a price that you're willing to pay. Now, the point that we make is that in a monetary model for a central bank, the argument runs into a pitfall because it abstracts from the reaction of the inflation expectation of the private sector. So what happens in this case is what we are going to call the cautiousness bias. If the private sector can foresee that the central bank is going to cut interest rate less, then it's going to form lower inflation expectations, which is going to put forward additional lower pressure on inflation, which is going in the end to force the central bank to cut interest rates further than it was initially willing to. So that's Ultimately, the central bank easily finds itself in a situation when it cuts rates as much as it did not want to, but with inflation which fall further below target. It neither have its cake nor eat it in a way. As you uh, probably can see, there is a parallel here with the inflation bias of Kindlen and Prescott. In particular, it depends on the inflation expectations of the, private, of the private sector and how they respond to policy. One point that I want to stress right now is that there is a big difference, which is that it's not related to a desire by the central bank to set output above potential output. So it's a distinct bias, which uh, requires distinct solutions. Okay, so here was just the outline for, for the talk today. Basically, we are going to, to take a cubist approach and to look at this bias under various specification of the Phillips curve relationship between output and inflation. At the end, I would like also to say maybe a few words on unconventional policies. Okay, so let me skip the literature review and let me start with the simplest model that we found to just 
uh, explain the logic behind this bias. So we are going to deliver on the simplicity here. That's just a two equation model with a Euler equation and a Phillips curve, which is the simplest that you can think of, the new classical Phillips curve, meaning that the inflation expectation are the rational expectation for formed last periods of inflation. Okay, there is just one thing to add to this model, which is uncertainty. And there is model uncertainty on the side of the central bank in the sense that it does not exactly know the value of the elasticity of substitution. So it has some, some beliefs on this with an average sigma bar and a variance V of sigma. Okay, just a few remarks. The private sector is going to know sigma and is not going to face any model uncertainty. We want to focus on the uncertainty of the central bank. So we will use different notation for the expectation of the central bank, E star, and E for the private sector. Also, there is no uncertainty about kappa, but that's just because uh, actually it uh, makes the case for the brain our principle uh, stronger when there is only uncertainty for sigma. So we want to focus on this case. Okay, so this is what the central banks want to do. Uh, we are going to assume that it cares only about inflation. And the program of the central bank will be to minimize uh, the square loss of the deviation of inflation from its target. And the central bank decides of the pass for the, uh, the allocation. We are not considering implementation uh, considerations here. So it only decides of the pass. And for this, we can look at the real interest rate, which is what we are going to do with a change of variable. Okay, just a word about the fact that we focus on an inflation mandate. It's not at all necessary for the results, but we want to stress two things. First, that the bias arises even if you don't care about output. It's distinct from the inflation bias. It's something different. And also we want to emphasize that it means that the bias applies to a central bank with only an inflation bias, with only an inflation mandate, sorry. Okay, uh, another actually benefits of uh, considering a single inflation mandate is that you can fall exactly back to Brainard's original argument and original model. So this is Brainard's uh, paper in a nutshell. It's basically considering a policymaker which has an objective Y and an instrument P. And the two are related by uh, a linear relationship, except that the policymaker has uncertainty on the effect of its policies. Now with just a little bit of algebra, if you consider uh, the problem of the central bank under discretion, meaning that it takes the inflation expectation of the private sector as given, you can go back exactly to this Brainer framework up to one differences, which is the presence of inflation expectation here coming from the Phillips curve. So otherwise the central bank decides of the real interest rate in order to set uh, an objective for the inflation rate. The only difference is those inflation expectations. So you can easily recover the brain up principle. You just need to fix uh, inflation expectation and don't try to endogenize them. In this case, to understand the brain up principle, which is right here, it's useful to decompose this objective between average inflation and the subjective volatility of inflation from the perspective of the central bank. So the, the one rate that minimizes the first term here is this rate, which is the policy under certainty, which basically consists in tracking the natural rate. But in order to minimize the variance of inflation, the central banks would like to do less to just stay near the steady state level of interest rate. So if it cares about both, it's going to attenuate this policy under certainty by a coefficient alpha, which is decreasing in the amount of uncertainty that it faces. Okay, just note that the central bank, if it behaves this way, knows very well that inflation is not going to be on target, but it's fine with it. It sees it as, as a cost worth paying in order to avoid inflation uncertainty. Now, the point that we make is that the idea that you need to attenuate policy is actually premature for the moment because inflation expectation are going to react to this. So if you endogenize inflation expectation, here are the rational expectations. And you see that as long as there is some attenuation, alpha is greater than one. And as long as the private sector anticipates the shock, you're gonna have inflation expectations that are not on target by star. So that in the end, once you take that into account, the real rate in equilibrium is going to have this expression. If the private sector does not foresee that 
shocks have been hitting the economy, then you do see attenuation in equilibrium. But if this private sector do notice that something is happening to the economy, then you actually end up in a situation where you have no attenuation at all. You end up doing exactly the same thing as you would have done if you had not tried to attenuate policy to start with. Okay. Uh, but this does not mean that everything is just equivalent because this does not mean that the inflation outcome is the same. You can actually easily show that inflation is going to depart from the target by the following amount. And whenever the shock is anticipated, it's going to be more than it would have been if you did not care about uncertainty and especially if you were instead behaving under commitment. So this is the, uh, the departure from of inflation from targets under commitment, and this is under discretion. And you can see that under discretion, you see a bias that occurs whenever you try to attenuate policy and the policy move is anticipated by the private sector. Okay, so what can you do to guard yourself against this bias? Here we can borrow from the, the, the literature on the inflation bias. So specifically, Rogoff famously proposed uh, to appoint a central banker with a different uh, loss function than society. So here we are going to, to trick this argument to apply it to, to this specific problem and consider the possibility of appointing a central bankers who discounts the concern over uncertainty with a delta here. And you can show that unless all shocks are uh, not perceived by the private sector, it's always optimal to discount uncertainty concern, this variance term, somewhat. And the more the private sector foresees what's going on, uh, the more you need to discount them. You can interpret this delta in different way. You can say that uh, you want to appoint a foolhardy uh, central banker or a central bank that trusts its, its model more, uh, but you don't have to, to make this interpretation. You can also uh, say that you want to appoint a central banker who is aware of this bias and want to discount consciously uh, this uncertainty concern to avoid the bias. So this is for uh, the cautiousness bias under the new classical Phillips curve, which give you uh, the, the intuition uh, and the rational behind the mechanism. But there is some problem with this um, Phillips curve, basically, that it has no dynamics, uh, so that everything is subsumed to a one period uh, equilibrium. More realistically, we want to, to think that this happens sequentially. At first, the central bank attenuates its policy, uh, as a consequence, inflation falls below target. The inflation expectations of the private sector falls in consequence, which pushes inflation further down, which forces the central bank to act. And this is the kind of dynamics that you can get if you assume a model, if you assume a Phillips curve that uh, incorporates that the private sector slowly learn about uh, what's the shocks that are hitting the economy. So one, one way to do it is to use uh, Ricardo's curve with, uh, with Mancu the sticky information Phillips curve. And this is what I'm going to show you uh, right now. So it actually doesn't change the logic of uh, the this cautiousness bias. The objective of the central bank under discretion is still the same. And the structure of the solution is still the same, at least if you uh, consider the long-term real interest rate, which I'm going to note with an uppercase here. The central bank is still willing to attenuate here with a coefficient alpha, it's policy under certainty. And the policy under certainty is uh, just to track the natural rate. The difference is that those inflation expectations are different and they are going to react endogenously in a different way than previously. You can show uh, in a close form uh, what the, this dynamic is going to be. The best way for me to show you the results is to uh, give you an IRF under a specific shock. So if you assume an AR1 process for the shocks, and if you calibrate the model in this standard uh, fashion here, I'm assuming that the central bank attenuates policy by a quarter, you get the following result. So initially, maybe you should look at first at the red dotted line. This is what the central bank would like to do if inflation expectations were fixed. The central bank would attenuate the decrease in interest rate in response to the, to the deflationary shocks, and it would do as you can see on both graphs here, 75% of what it would do. But this is without taking into account the reaction of inflation expectation. As you can see, initially they don't move, but slowly they start to actually reach 
actual inflation so that the fall in inflation uh, is becoming much more pronounced than the central bank was initially expecting. So that the central bank soon starts reacting just as much as it was initially reluctant to. You can see that for the short-term interest rate, it actually attenuates a lot at the beginning because it the financial market anticipates what's going to happen to long-term rates, but then it just behaves the same. This is for the real rate, for the nominal rate, actually, it has to decrease rate by even more later uh, in time than it was uh, willing to initially. Okay, so uh, this is for the two uh, first Phillips curve, the new classical Phillips curve, the sticky information Phillips curve, which are both backward looking in a, in a sense, uh, and at least are different from the new Kinjan Phillips curve, uh, which is much more forward looking. So because the new Keynesian Phillips curve is much more used in applied macro still, and because it has a very different dynamics, we just want to show that this is a bias that occurs just as well for this new Phillips curve. Uh, so this is this result here. If you assume that uh, the shocks follow an air one, you can actually get a closed form solution that has a very intuitive expression. The real long-term interest rate is going to be the product of those two terms time the natural rate. This term is the same attenuation coefficient as before, so you want to do less, but because of the reaction of inflation expectation, you are actually going uh, to do more. So this is greater than one, this is less than one. And your desire to attenuate policy runs into this pitfall that you actually don't attenuate that much. Uh, the only difference with the new Keynesian Phillips curve is that everything happens on impact here, uh, because of the front loaded dynamics of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. Uh, before concluding, I just want to, to mention uh, a few things about unconventional policies. So I've just presented you everything in terms of interest rate policy for concreteness, but all the argument applies equally to unconventional monetary policy. Uh, what is key to the argument is the relationship between aggregate demand and inflation, it's the Phillips curve. So as long as unconventional monetary policy are just alternative way to stimulate aggregate demand, everything applies equally. However, because unconventional policies are likely the one whose effect is most uncertain, uh, there is even more of a reason to be aware of this cautiousness bias when you're dealing with unconventional policies. And the argument for maybe being very careful, being very gradual in implementing policy in the Eurozone, for instance, has been also very much related to the fact that the tools were new. Another argument that I just mentioned is that uh, you can easily end up in a situation in which if you do not internalize this cautiousness bias, you end up moving nominal interest rate by more than you would have to otherwise. So that you can end up against the uh, effective lower bound, even if you wouldn't have had to actually go to the, to the ELB if you had not tried to attenuate your policy. So uh, there is uh, a possibility of actually having to do more unconventional policies because you were too slow or too, uh, too, too cautious to start with. Another uh, quick point that I want to mention is that obviously uncertainty is not the only rationale for moving gradually. And in particular, there is this argument uh, in Woodford 2003 that being gradual caring about not moving interest rates too fast can be a way under discretion to implement the commitment policy. Uh, simply put, if you don't want to move interest rates too fast, uh, you're doing some lower for longer. And we know that this has beneficial properties uh, in many of our models. And the only thing that I want to say here is that this is very true, but this is unrelated to uncertainty. So you should not do more of this when the situation becomes more uncertain. In relationship to uh, unconventional monetary policy, the Woodford argument here is actually an argument for uh, doing more um, unconventional policy, doing more forward guidance specifically, if you, uh, if you are DLB. Okay, so let me uh, just conclude, uh, maybe by uh, recalling that the point of our paper here is not that uncertainty does not justify moving cautiously, just that central banks face a bias toward being overly cautious. And let me just um, uh, finish by, by quoting this, uh, 
uh, this sentence by Peter Pratt uh, two years ago, where he was actually a bit uh, anticipating on the, the COVID crisis, saying, well, maybe in crisis time, you need, to, um, uh, you need to act very decisively, but in normal times, it's good to be gradual. Uh, and we, we certainly don't disagree with this, but the point that we want to emphasize in this paper is that actually uh, the risk when you want to act very decisively because there is some risk to uh, inflation uh, anchoring might precisely be due to the fact that you didn't act decisively to start with. And now that we are moving to a situation uh, which might not be a crisis uh, situation anymore and central bank might be tempted to go back to behaving in a more cautious manner, uh, this is the, the message that we wanted to convey with this paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. That was great. Uh, yes, we're out of time. Sorry, with the conference and the transitions, we need the nine minutes to change the rooms. But thank you to all the participants. I thought this was extremely interesting and shows how current events are influencing theory in the best kind of theory of thinking about how to solve real problems in a very applied sense. So I was very, I learned a lot in the last two hours. I hope everyone did too. So thank you to the whole presenters. Bye-bye to everyone. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.